Father, I pray that you would be with us today, that you would be in the midst of us at this time. Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, that your voice would be clear and that your word would reign true in us. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I, I, I realize I look Korean. Um, I, you know, if you don't know me, uh, I, I have Korean parents, and genetically or ethnically, I look Korean. But there's a problem with this, a, 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 kind, of, a kind of a big one. I don't speak Korean very well. So on the outside, I look Korean, but then when uh, you want me to speak in Korean, I go, ha, 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 I'm American, <laughs> please, I speak English. And it's not that I don't understand Korean. Um, you know, thankfully, I, I have a little bit of comprehension, um, but just really when I try to speak the words that come out, they're just, it's, it's not even broken Korean. That's insulting to people that speak broken Korean. It's just bad. And I was trying to figure out, why am I so bad at Korean? Like, why am I, why am I unable to speak Korean? I, I can speak English just fine. Why can I not speak Korean? Am I too stupid? Is Korean too complex of a language for me really to have a grasp, not only to understand, but to speak it with fluency and to be able to, to communicate in, in that language? And, and, and trust me, I have a lot of envy of people that speak um, bilingual, bilingually really well. I, I have envy of people that speak multiple languages because it's so beautiful. Like when you hear someone praying in Korean, and as a pastor, when I hear someone praying in Korean, I'm like, dang it, man. I want to learn how to speak in Korean. I want to learn how to do that. And so why can I not do this? And it goes back to my childhood. It goes back to a childhood wound. It's when I was a kid. My, my parents, and um, if you've never met my parents and you hear them speak, they speak English like I do. They speak English better than I do. They speak English as well as I do. And, and they have no accent. They have no flaws. And so in our house, we didn't speak Korean. We spoke English. Like in many of your households, it, English is the primary language. And so as a child growing up, I didn't hear Korean a lot. I didn't speak Korean a lot. And so what ended up happening was I would go to church, and I went to a Korean church, and there was Korean school. And we would go in Korean school, and we would go inside, and um, my friends at church spoke Korean at home. Their parents spoke to them in Korean. And so I was going to class, to Korean school class, with people that spoke Korean at home. And so imagine, as a child, and I was a straight-A student. I, I want you to remember. I was a straight-A student. Going into this class and failing so hard. And not even because I couldn't do the work. The work was relatively easy. But failing in the sense that when I opened my mouth and I started to speak in Korean, you would hear the giggles. <laughs> You would hear the laughs. You would hear the shame. Shame. You're Korean, and you speak Korean worse than Chinese people. And it's like, oh, man. And it's that shame. It's that humiliation. There was, it was humiliating because there would be times I would have to go up in front of the class, and there would be this sheet of these hieroglyphic letters that should be easy enough to read, and you start reading it, and you stumble through it. People laugh. People joke. And, 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 and you feel this humiliation that as a child, I made a point. I am not going to go through that humiliation. I'm not going to go through this negative emotion. And so you know what I'm going to do instead? I'm going to study English. I'm going to go to my English classes. I'm going to read literature. I'm going to be able to, to memorize these speeches and these monologues and speak really well. Because you know what? You may speak Korean, but at least I can speak English. And, it, and it's not even that angry, really. It's, it's still a lot of shame, you know? I, even now, it's not like I can come up here and say, well, I've been working the past three years, and now I speak Korean perfectly. No, my Korean's still really bad. But it's that humiliation, it's that shame that I've been straying so far from. And what I learned is, when I was in college, when I was in college, it was very interesting. I took an accelerated Korean course. And I don't know if you, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny that it's even called that in college. Because the accelerated Korean course means that it's just a class full of people that knew Korean already, that just want a free A. And I took the class, not because I wanted a free A, I took the class because I wanted to learn Korean. But what ended up happening is I was in this class with all my friends who knew Korean already, and it was the same process over. And the thing was, they, they knew Korean, so it was an easy A for them, and for me, I actually struggled, and it was really difficult, it was really hard. And so there was an opportunity for me to go teach English in Korea, 
my junior year of college, and I thought, you know, ne I've never really lived in Korea. I've never lived there, and it's my heritage. It's, my, it's where my, you know, my, my people are from, so I, I should go. And I went, and I taught English at an a, uh, elementary school, and, you know, it was great. And my Korean improved substantially because why? I had to use it. Because whenever I would go anywhere, it wasn't humiliating. I mean, there was a lot of humiliation, let me tell you. But it wasn't humiliating to me as badly as when I was a child. Because what? I'm sorry, when I order food in Korea, when I talk to the guy who's at the subway station, when I go to the grocery store and I'm trying to find what I need to find, I don't know Korean, but I got to communicate to you somehow. You don't know English, I don't know Korean, and so I'm going to try to use my broken Korean to talk to you. And what ended up happening is I broke through that barrier of the discomfort. I broke through the barrier of the humiliation, and it actually helped me grow in my, in my comfort with even learning this language. And it got better. And I realized this isn't just with language. It applies to sports. You know, uh, I like to play basketball. I used to like to play basketball. I don't have time anymore. I wish I did. But I used to play basketball. And you, when you play basketball with someone, and, and it's humiliating if you don't know. Because if you don't know how to play basketball, and it's your first time, and you're a guy, and you're, you're not a child anymore, and you are in these groups, and someone's dribbling the ball like this, it's inherently humiliating. And I remember when I was first getting into basketball, it was kind of like that. You know, uh, you know, you're just constantly being humiliated. And in order to get better, you have to get over it. You have to get over that humiliation. But what ends up happening so commonly, especially in human culture, just, in, just being a human, is when you're faced with this humiliation, we do everything in our power to stay away from it. We do everything in our power just to hide that away to a point where no one can see that shameful aspect. Whether it's with language, with hobbies, with relationships, with your interests, whatever it may be. We want to hide what embarrasses us. To a point where when I, I go on these retreats or I, I meet new people and there's always those icebreaking questions and I, I hate coming up with icebreakers and I'm sure you don't like icebreakers either, but there's that icebreaker. What's your most embarrassing story? I hate that question because every time it's asked, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to think about my most embarrassing story. So I, I, I sh whenever I have an embarrassing moment, and I have a lot, so let me tell you, I shove it down. I just push it as far down as possible to a point where I forget about it because I don't want to... I don't want to think about my embarrassing moments. There are times where I'm in the shower and I'm just washing my hair. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I said that to someone. Oh my goodness, I can't believe that happened. And, and you just shove down this humiliation. A lot of us, a lot of you, are very successful people. You're very established. And, and whether you like it or not, we like being right. We like being on the winning side. Many of you are competitive, like I am. You don't want to be embarrassed. You want to win. You want to be strong. You want to be successful. And so what we do naturally, and I'm not shaming anyone, that's the whole opposite of this, what we naturally do is we put our best foot forward. We show people our strength. We show people how strong we are. And we cover our weaknesses. We minimize our weakness. And we maximize our strength. We leverage our strength. And we get someone else to do the weak things. We get someone else to cover those holes. Today I want to teach you from the book of James. And we're going to be in the book of James for quite a while. And so uh, we're just going kind of in shorter sections than I'm used to. But James chapter 1, starting from verse 9. And I just want to read you the word. I'll read you the whole passage. And then I'm going to go backwards and just go section by section. But just let it speak to you. More than anything, what I want to teach you is when we go into the word, whether it's in a sermon or whether it's just at a coffee shop and you have an, uh, your phone and your Bible app open, when you go into the word, we don't just read the word, we let the word examine us. And 
if you don't know what that means, if that sounds like hocus pocus, you might be right. But when I say let the word examine you, the word is living and active. God wants to use these words. A lot of us want to hear the words of God, and yet the words of God are written and established, and we're like, I don't want to listen to the word, but I want to hear God's word. It's like you're going crazy. The, wor- the word is right here. God is speaking to you if you let him speak to you. So James chapter 1, verse 9 says, Let the lowly brother boast. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass its flower falls and its beauty perishes so also with the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Let me, let me just explain that this text is not easy in any way because it begins with something that I, I believe that we just don't like. And that's, it begins by saying, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Let the lowly one boast. And I think what ends up naturally happening, happening is, uh, first of all, when someone's lowly, when someone is kind of on the bottom, at rock bottom, what we, what we naturally like to do is we like to encourage them. And, and, and let me just kind of break it down for you. When someone's on rock bottom, we like to encourage them and say, hey, things are going to get better. Things are, going, uh, things are going to be good. You're on rock bottom. Things are going to be better. And that person, that person, when they're at rock bottom, they're like, yeah, I'm at rock bottom. This is terrible. This is, this is the worst. And then when things go well for that person on rock bottom and things start to turn and things start to look good and they begin to get excited that things are turning good, what we're good at is we're good at that first party where, um, you know, we, we have dinner with them, and it's like, how's life? You know, you were at rock bottom. Things were terrible. It looks like things are going well. And that person's like, yeah, things are going great. Things are going good. And, you know, God is really, like, he's really active. My faith is growing. I'm, I'm getting stronger. I'm getting great. And that's the point where we're really good at, like, saying, hey, that's great. That's wonderful. And we celebrate with them in that. And we're like, man, I'm so glad that you're no longer at rock bottom. It was kind of hard dealing with you when you were at rock bottom. You know, it was, was kind of hard carrying you. So I'm glad things are, things are going well. What we're bad at is that second meeting, that third meeting, that fourth meeting with this lowly person. When what they need is this continual encouragement, their ability to say, man, I was so dead before and now God is helping me to become alive again. And what we need, what I need is just to keep telling you my testimony. Yeah, you've heard my testimony a hundred times, but let me tell it to you again. And this is where we get bad at. It's like, man, I've heard your story. I've heard how hard it was before. Can we just like move on and like you're getting to a point, you're getting a little arrogant, you're getting a little prideful. I remember this happened to me. I was so excited about my faith and the excitement that I had wasn't in the successes. It was just, I mean, there are seasons. There are seasons where your faith is on fire. There are seasons where everything was dead and is coming to life, and you want to shout it at the top, the, the top of your lungs. You want to go to the rooftops and say, you know, just how good things are, and to boast in this resurrection, this redemption that God has given. And let me tell you, this is what has happened with me. This is why, I, I, you know, I'm a pastor. It's because God took me from that bottom of the barrel, and he has been growing in me this passion, this restoration. I'm just like, I want to share with you. 
that I'm excited to talk about with you. But what I realize, a lot of people are just like, calm down. Stop being so arrogant. Stop being so boastful. And it's like, wait, 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 wait. I'm boasting the fact that God is the only one who can bring the good gifts to me. It's like, you know what? Hold your horses. And I think what ends up happening is a lot of us are this second person, this rich man, this rich person who needs to become a boaster of their humiliation. And I believe it's because we do not do this well that we cannot do the first thing well. That because we do not know how to boast in our humiliation, we are not good at celebrating and boasting our exaltation. Because we are not good at boasting in our humiliation, we become really bad at celebrating our exaltation. And what I mean by this is this, is because for a lot of us, we are so good at humble bragging. Let me say that again. A lot of us are good at humble bragging. And I don't know if you know what that means. It's like a hashtag, like humble brag. Humble brag is, is, is when you are bragging about something in kind of a humble way. You know? It's like, hey, look at my new, my new car. But it's, it's, in, it's in red. I wanted it in black. You know? It's not, it's not the model I wanted. I wanted the next one, but they didn't have it in stock, so I had to settle for this. It, it, it's, it's when you get that... It's when you get that promotion, it's when you get that something good happening to you that you're trying to express just how good it is and we want to really boast and we want to be proud, but we know culturally boasting and being proud is not going to be received well. I mean, we know boastful people, people that go out and they're, they just think that the world revolves around them. And so we learn, like, let's not talk like that. But what ends up happening is, is that we're still good at boasting. We just do it in a very, like, good way. We do it in a very acceptable and socially acceptable way where, you know what, I'm sorry. This just happens from the time we're children that we learn to get in our brags, to get in our boastfulness without offending people. And what ends up happening is instead of boasting in our humiliation, we begin just to have this fake humility regarding our boasting and exaltation. Today's message centers around this idea that I've been wrestling with. That I've been, I've been just going to war with God with. And I still am not fully sure if I even have the answer. And I think that's what makes it so difficult sometimes to come before you to tell you this is God's word when I'm like, I don't even know what, what, what I'm going through right now. But what I'm learning is, what I'm learning truly, and I'm trying my best to get better at, is to have courage in the face of humiliation. What I'm trying to teach you is to have courage in the face of humiliation. To stand firm in the face of humiliation. See, a lot, of, a lot of us, and myself included, I remember I was in high school, and I heard a sermon on humility, and the pastor was talking about praying for humility. And, you know, all of us, if you're human, that prayer is a very scary prayer. God, give me humility, but please don't humiliate me. I, th I think that's, that's how I prayed it. God, would you just give me this humble spirit, this ability just to be a humble and meek and good person who is not proud or boastful, but please don't humiliate me, Regard no matter what you do. And I, I was in high school, and in high school especially, I wanted to be cool. I was not cool, but I wanted to be really cool. God, just train me to be humble, but whatever you do, what you're not allowed to do, what I can just say, please just refrain from, is using humiliation as a pathway to humility. And I think God kind of looked at me and was like, well... I'm not trying to humiliate you. I don't want to humiliate you. But the fact that you're so afraid of being humbled means that you cannot be trained. It means that you're prideful. The fact that you don't want any humiliation means you're prideful. And that was a hard lesson to learn even now. But I realize it's because God wants to coach me. He wants to train and he wants to teach me. But again, imagine, using a, another sports analogy, imagine that I don't know how to catch. 
And I don't know how to, how to receive that football, the over-the-shoulder throw. And, and as the ball comes in my hands, it, I, I'm just so afraid of failure. I'm so afraid of the humiliation that even though God is saying, all right, I'm going to throw you this, this pass, and it's going to be an over-the-shoulder throw, and it's hard to catch, it's going to be difficult, but you know what? It's, it's the fourth quarter, game's tied, one down left, and, 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 you're, gonna, and you're just running that, you're running that streak. You're, you're, running that, you're running that end zone, end zone fade, and you got to catch it. Imagine if that receiver says, no, 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 but if I miss it, but if I, if, if I bobble that catch, I'm going to be humiliated. If I, if I run that route, and, and if that ball is perfectly in place, and I just bobble it and I drop it, imagine how many people are going to laugh at me. See, being afraid of humiliation negates the ability for you to be exalted. You have to be willing to drop that pass, to go through the consequences of dropping that pass. And let me tell you, you're going to drop the pass sometimes. You're not going to catch that ball and get the glory of getting that game-winning touchdown every time. There are times that God is going to throw you that ball and you're going to be like, I got it, I got it, and it's going to slip out of your hands and in front of all your family and your friends, you're going to have failed. And people are going to say, man, that guy sucks. He's on my fantasy football team. I lost because of this guy. I hate him. You're going to face this kind of hate when you drop the ball. But the question is, are you courageous in the face of humiliation? Are you willing to stand firm even if failure is probable? You'll never grow unless you learn how to boast in your humiliation. You'll never grow until you learn to have courage that, yes, you might fail. You might look stupid. You might look dumb, but you'll never grow. You'll never get better until you let go of your pride and say, Lord, I might get humiliated. I probably will get humiliated. But you know what? I want to try. Put me in that position to make that catch. And so this is why this goes so hand in hand with something called desire. And I want to teach you about desire because I have a lot of desires. And as a Christian, I think if you grow up in the church, there is this lie that's been told to you. And oh man, I'm so excited to share this lie with you because I tell, tell it to myself all the time, is that your desires are all bad and they're all temptations. Like the lie that we are constantly reminded of as believers and if you especially if you grew up in the church if you didn't grow up in the church that's great but i'm sure you've heard about churches that really talk about christianity being a negation of desire about this this type of faith that's just like i have these evil and sinful and carnal desires and i need to learn just to throw them all away for me it was like man that sucks and not only does that suck like then the Christians are the most boring people because when they have a desire to have fun, they need to push it down. Stop yourself from really having these desires because what people have done with religion is turn these desires into temptation. What James explains is do not do this evil thing of saying that God is the one who has tempted you. Do not say that God is the one tempting you to do evil because God is not tempted nor can he tempt. This is what James is trying to teach and trying to express is that temptation and desires are different things. They're related, absolutely, but they're far different. See, your desires are a gift from God. When you were born, when you were growing up, I'm sure your parents have told you, or I'm sure that your siblings have told you that you had some kind of a desire. You had a passion. You, were, you liked doing certain things or you acted a certain way. God gave you these God-given, these naturally built-in desires that are good. And just to name some, some of you had a desire for relationship, a desire to be loved. Some of you had a desire for knowledge, to know, to, to understand, to figure things out. Some of you had a desire for control. Some of you wanted to make sure that things were in the right place, things were done in the correct way. Some of you had a desire for power. 
Some of you had a desire for wealth. What ends up happening is this. These desires are all good desires. They're bad once we try to fulfill them in our lives. So let me take the, the example of the desire for wealth. There are some of you that you just want to be wealthy. And I think when you come to church, it's like, oh, oh goodness, like I, I need to learn. Um, the rich man getting into the kingdom of heaven is like a man, it's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. It's just not possible. And so what I need to do is that desire for me to be rich, that desire for me to be wealthy, I just need to suppress it and push it down because it's just a bad temptation. No, what's bad is that you think that you're the one who's going to make yourself wealthy, that you think it's your hard work, that it's your job, that it's your career, that it's your knowledge, it's your skills and ability that's going to get you that promotion, that's going to get you more money, that's going to help you buy that investment, that right stock, that, that, right, that right company that you go into, and you're going to become wealthy based on what you've done. What God explains is that it's not the desire for wealth that's bad, it's your method in obtaining that wealth that becomes a temptation. It becomes intertwined with greed. You know, the Bible talks a lot about wealth. But the wealth the Bible talks about is about a treasure that is stored for us in heaven where, wrath, where, where moths and rust cannot destroy. A place where your wealth is eternal. God wants you to understand richness, but he wants you to understand a richness that will not fade away, that is stored forever. The same goes for the desire for power. Some of you, it's not even the money that you're interested in. It's like the control, the authority, that when you say jump, people say, all right, how high? And you have this desire for power. I hope you understand that when we are with God in heaven, and the fact that even today, because the Holy Spirit resides in you, you have power, you have authority. The temptation comes when you try to enact your own authority and your own power. You try to do it on your own way rather than doing it the way of God. All of our desires are marred by our sin. And our sin is simple. It's my way, not God's way. Sin is very simple. Sin is, I'm going to do this the way that I want to, and I don't care how God says to do it. I'm going to do it my way. It's not that your desires are bad. It's not that this innate desire that you have, if it's for a family, if it's for a relationship, if it's for money, if it's for wealth, it's for power, it's for any of these things. Some of you just, you're, you're, like, you're like me. You just want to be liked and you want to be loved. There's nothing wrong with that. But the way in which you do this and you accomplish this is of utmost importance. Truly, when I, when I talk about temptation... When I talk about these desires, I don't want you to feel negated in any way. A lot of you, when I speak with you, you have these deep, these deep desires. And I want to help you, I want to help you find those, the solutions. I want to have you excited about life. I want to have you excited about what God is doing in you and how he's blessing you. But I know something is that if you fall into this idea of temptation where you're the one who's calling the shots, these desires are only going to lead to what James talks about, and that's death. Your money's going to fade away. Your power is going to be abused. Your relationships are going to be broken. It's going to be hurtful. It's going to be painful. What I'm trying to bring to you is, is that instead of being afraid, instead of being afraid of God, it's all about trusting him. When it comes to faith, I think my biggest issue is, is a lot of times God isn't very clear with me. I don't know what God is saying. I don't know where he's leading. I don't know what he's doing. A lot of times I, 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 really, I tell people, I wish God just gave me a manual, a, a, a playbook. That would, it would, I, I just, it would just, I would just know, all right? I do this, I do that. And, and people are like, well, well, isn't the Bible your playbook? Yeah, okay, yes. But at the same time, it doesn't answer the question of what city am I supposed to live in? The Bible does not say, Jeremy, you got to live in Denver. Like, I, I, didn't, I, don't know, I don't know any of that stuff. So you go to God wanting all the answers so that I can just follow. But what I'm realizing is about trust. It's about faith. It's that when we have these desires, these deep desires, 
that we have to learn to lean into humiliation, to lean into humility, rather than focusing so much on exaltation, so much on success, so much on being on the right side, that we are willing to be made fun of, we are willing to be put down, and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt so bad. It's going to be so painful. But let me tell you, when you lean into that humiliation, that is when God can use you, because it's not about being successful, it's about being delighted by him. In Psalms, it explains, and it's another verse that I've been chewing on. In Psalms, it says, it says, delight yourselves in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I remember reading that backwards. I want the desires of my heart, so i got to learn to delight myself in the Lord. You know, if, if the equation is delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. So I want the desires of my heart, so I'm going to praise really loud today. When, when, when the worship songs come on, I'm going to sing at the top of my lungs. I'm going to look good. I'm going to learn how to preach. I'm going to learn how to read the word. And then God's going to be the desires of my heart. Wrong. It's delight yourselves in the Lord, learn to love him, learn to trust him, learn to be in relationship with him, and the only outcome is success. But the path which God wants to bring you success is humility, is failure. It's the path Jesus took. See, Jesus deserved a crown of gold. (laughs) Jesus deserved all of the recognition. He deserved all glory, honor, and praise while he was here on earth. And you know what? If I was Jesus, and thank God I'm not, if I was Jesus and I was able to walk on water, you know what? I would be, I would be on water and singing like Beyonce. You know, walk on water. You know, like, I, I, would, I would do it so people could see me. And know, and know how powerful I am, how good I am. And it's like, yes, God is good, but look at what I can do. Is I can multiply your food. I can make sure that your life is good. You're sick. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Boom, you're healed. Ha ha. No, but Jesus chose a very different path. And this is why it's hard. That path he took was a path of humiliation. Humiliation is like a bad word in the church, I realize. It's like, because it's again that, that idea I want humility without the humiliation. I want humility without the pain, without the sorrow. I'm sorry, Jesus took a path of pure humiliation. He deserved that crown of gold, but instead he chose. He chose. He chose the crown of thorns. It was not that it was destined to him to have that crown of thorns even though it was in his destiny. He chose that crown of thorns because he knows it is the rich man that needs to boast in his humiliation. And so we boast as rich people, boasting in the humiliation of Christ on the cross. That's why we gather. We don't gather because Jesus does these miracles. We don't gather because he fed the 5,000. We don't gather because he healed the sick. We gather because our Savior was publicly humiliated, that he was spat on. That's why we boast. And when Jesus was lowly, when he was truly on rock bottom, when he was in the pits of hell, God exalted him. Brother, sister, Lean in to humility. Be courageous. In times where it can most likely lead to your humiliation and you don't want God to choose you, you are saying, please don't call me, please don't call me, please don't call me. I'm saying God is gracious and so he won't call you. But if you want to grow, if you want to be better, you need to be willing to be made a fool. And God will then Redeem the desires of your heart. I go to weddings as the pastor now. It's kind of weird. I've done like five weddings this year. And I go as a pastor, and I always wonder to myself when I go as the officiant, you know, how do I need to look, right? Like, not only do, what do I wear, but how do I got to act? Like, I, I, I'm, I'm just like myself. I don't know how to act all the time. And so there are times I go, it's like, all right, so I got to be prim and proper because I got to represent, like, the church, There comes a point, like always, like 10 minutes in, like, nah, forget that. I'm just going to be myself. And, and, you know, there's some weddings. I take off my jacket when it's time, and I just start dancing. And let me tell you, I'm not a good dancer. It's humiliating. Because I'm the pastor, 
It's like, isn't that the guy that gave the sermon? Yes, yeah, the guy that gave the sermon. And I'm like, I'm like going into it. And there was a point where I didn't want that humiliation. I didn't want to be the one messing around and looking like a fool. And so I would be that guy in the very back. No, 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 please. I don't want to dance. I don't want to dance. But learning the way that you enjoy life, the way that you enjoy yourself, the way that you have fun, the way that life the desires of this life begin to just embrace you is when you learn to lean into humiliation. And you know what? It's going to be humiliating. People are going to laugh. But you know what? I would rather people laugh at me and for me to be dancing with my Savior. I would rather people persecute me while I am dancing and loving my Savior because I know my treasures in heaven. I know the desires of my heart will be granted by him. I think I've lost sight of that, really. Because even though Jesus is calling me to be in humiliating circumstances with him, come on, dance. Come on. Jesus, I don't know how to dance. <laughs> I don't want to dance with you. I'm going to look like a fool. People are going to laugh at me. Come on, son, just dance with me. Just dance with me. It's going to be fun. You're going to have a good time. I think I'm learning. All right, Jesus, I'll try. Little by little, just get that shoulder going. You know, little by little, all right, God, I'm going to follow you. People are laughing. They're laughing. They're laughing. All right, let me forget them and think of you. I think some of you need to do this on your own with the Lord. Some of you, God is calling you to serve. He's calling you to go out and do the things that will bring about humiliation to you. Some of you that's simply having a dinner with someone and telling them you're a Christian. It's going to be humiliating. They're going to look at you different. They're going to say, you, you're a Christian? You're one of those people? And you're going to have to be like, yeah, that's, that's who I am. I go to church. What? That's crazy. Yeah. Some of us have to lean into that before we can grow in our Lord and Savior. And guess what? You're going to get better. You're going to grow. It's going to be fun. Pray for me. I'm praying for you. I want our church to be courageous in leaning into being humiliated. I want our church not to be humiliated, but never to be afraid of being humiliated. Let's pray. Father, I pray you would humble us. I pray that you would put us through situations where we are humbled truly by you. And Father, I pray that with confidence. I pray that you would grow us. You would, you would call us to be put in situations where it puts us in uncomfortable and humiliating situations so that we can learn to, to delight ourselves in you, to delight ourselves in only you, to not care what the world thinks, to not care how much they laugh at us, how much they persecute us, how much they spit on us, but that instead of choosing that crown of gold, that we would be like Jesus and choose the crown of thorns that we would choose and be courageous to walk in humiliation because we know that you exalt the lowly ones. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.